We are now live, and hopefully this time we're on the OFO page. Welcome, everyone. I hope you can see us. I'm not seeing any viewers yet, but that'll just take a couple seconds, I'm sure. Um, uh, welcome to our second edition of uh, Learning About Optics, and tonight we are going to be focusing in on scopes and tripods for birding. I see we've got a couple people on. Welcome everyone. Um, just uh, to let you know, it's Sarah Rupert here. I'm hosting tonight. You can't see me at the moment, but you'll see me at the end of the presentation uh, when we have our question and answer period. Um, please feel free uh, to uh, make comments as we go in our discussion box. Um, I will be keeping an eye on that. So. Um, if, if you have any questions, you can put them into the chat and I'll make sure that they get posted at the end of the presentation. Um, if you just want to say hi and let us know where you're tuning in from on this lovely January evening, we'd uh, love to hear from you. Um, I should say Happy New Year to everyone. I know it's um, this is the first time I've been able to talk to everybody, so I'm uh, happy to see lots of people tuning in this evening. Uh, so we're just about five minutes after seven, so um, I don't think we're going to delay much longer tonight because we've actually got things running fairly smoothly. Uh, hi Violet from Sault Ste. Marie, nice to see you and having us join. So um, our good friend Jim is back again tonight uh, for part two because he couldn't fit all of his optics knowledge into one presentation. and. I'm sure everyone, uh, if you were at the binocular uh, presentation, you probably really appreciated all the great tips. If you missed the binocular presentation, don't worry. You can go and watch it on our Facebook page, or you can go to OFO's YouTube page and see it there as well. Um, and I know we're going to get this question in the chat, so I'm going to answer it before we uh, just preemptively. Yes, this presentation is being recorded. and. Um, so you'd be able to watch it back here on Facebook, and we will also be posting it to uh, the YouTube page. So there's going to be lots of options to watch it again. So if you don't, you know, say you forgot to write something down or you didn't get all of the information the first time around, you'll be able to go back and peruse it. And I know um, Jim's got all, I've, I've seen a brief flash through of the slides uh, with a mouse gesture. So I know there's lots of excellent information here. Um, and somebody's here from Gananoque and they're very excited because they're just about to buy a scope. So this is the perfect presentation for you tonight. So I'm going to pass it over to Jim and let him get starting to talk about scopes and tripods. Well, thank you, Sarah. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, we are definitely going to be talking all about spotting scopes and tripods for birding. So uh, let's get going. So what are we going to cover? Uh, well, spotting scopes. Terms of definitions, what you do know, what you should know and understand. What do the numbers mean? Tripods and tripod heads. We want to talk a bit about that because they definitely work together with your spotting scope. And uh, well, when you go to purchase a spotting scope, what what's the process? What should you do? And of course, with any type of uh, product or hobby, there's always accessories. So there's always those extra neat little things you can buy to go with it. So spotting scopes. Well, what is a spotting scope? Um, some people sometimes think of the astronomical telescope. Well, that's where the spotting scope started. Originally, that was the first thing used. And of course, they were staring at the stars and never worked well on, say, looking at terrestrial images. So Mr. Ignacio Poro came up with the Poro prism. So some of you may remember and still see there are still Poro prism binoculars around. That's where that name comes from. But he installed that prism in a Kepler telescope and created an upright image telescopes are inverted and all of a sudden he had a land-based spotting scope so why why spotting scope versus a telescope why go through that process of inventing something well astronomical scopes of course have magnification ranges up to like 125 to 675 so if you're looking at the moon and the stars you need a lot of magnification but on earth due to atmospheric conditions typically the best you can get a good image with is about an 80 times most spotting scopes, spotting scopes only go to 60. You are starting, starting to see some at the 70 range now. And um, 
if you've used a scope or when you go to use your scope and you get up into that 60 to say 70 mag range and you're out looking across the lake and you sort of see these wavy things that swell it's heat shimmer and that starts to happen when you get into these uh, high levels. So why use a spotting scope? Um, well, definitely have a much higher magnification than binoculars. So a lot of us go birding, we've got our binoculars. Typically we're using eights to tens, uh, while spotting scopes typically start around 20, and as I said, go up to 70. So it's a big difference there. Uh, but hot spotting scopes do tend to need support, tripods, monopods, etc. But there are some smaller size travel spotting scopes you could actually hand held, which is kind of neat. Uh, distance from a subject of viewing, I mean, that's the whole issue of the higher magnification. <clears throat> so if you're going out to watch waterfowl, <clears throat> excuse me, shorebirds, um, wading birds, gulls, going down to the lakeshore these days on Lake Ontario, we go down to say Sam Smith Park. I mean, the ducks can be far out and you're going to need to get good views. You need a scope. Head up to Niagara Falls to do the gull watch down in the gorge. A scope, scope is definitely going to be a big plus. So there, we're really going to just talk about refractive uh, spotting scopes versus there is another type called a cadioptric. Um, cadioptric scopes are more based and more typically used for uh, still watching stars. But there is one company, and I'll mention right that is uh, Celestron, that kind of sells one that they call a Mac scope, and it's used for both um, uh, we call above horizon and terrestrial applications. So we're really going to stick more to refractive scopes. So there's an example of the called the Mac telescope. I have been out birding at times and I have come across the odd person who's using one of these. Uh, not what I would choose, but uh, I guess if you're into stargazing and you know budgets are budgets, how much money is there? That is is something that you could potentially use as a as a you know, hey, I'm gonna look at the stars at night and the birds during the day. So two designs of the scopes we're going to talk about, uh, the straight scope and the angled scope. And that's pretty much the standard designs you're going to find. Um, basically, those come in, there's two options with scopes, whether they're fixed or angled. It's the eyepiece is not interchangeable. And that typically means it's got a fixed magnification. Um, Spotting scopes typically have removable eyepieces, which means the scope, you can change out the eyepiece, you can add in different magnification. And typically what you're actually doing is switching out from a standard magnification to a wide angle option. Um, example, like of a fixed scope, when you go um, up into some of like, you know, the high towers and or some locations, they have those uh, eyeglass things you sit and look out on. Those are like fixed spotting scope because of high magnification. So you don't, I don't know that anybody really sells those and I don't know why you'd want to buy one for birding, but uh, they do exist. Spotting scopes do come in three sizes mainly, and that's the full size and the objective lens. So that kind of dictates often the size of the scope. They come with typically from 75 and now up to 115 millimeters. And that's something relatively new. Only last year they got up to 99 and then of course now they've bumped it up to 115 and you're going to find out why later, why they keep getting bigger and bigger. Uh, Mid-size scopes typically have an objective lens size from 60 to 65. In compact, these are the little guys and they go from typically 50 to 55 and that's the ones that sometimes you can get away with hand holding, which is kind of neat. So what are the parts of the spotting scope? So I'm going to go just running from uh, left to right at the top. So the retractable sunshade. And, and this is something that it's kind of like the same concept if you're into photography, that you've got that sunshade to help stop stray light bouncing off your front of your lens. That's exactly what that sunshade does for a spotting scope. You've got a focus dial. So in other words, hey, I wanna, I'm looking at something, it's blurry. I'm gonna refocus it. There's my focus dial. You've got magnification adjustment ring. So corresponding scopes aren't, again, we're not talking really about fixed magnification. So these are lens uh, eyepieces that have multiple magnification levels on them. You have a twist eye cup. Um, that's important uh, because as we talk later, you'll find out you're going to need it if you're wearing glasses or not. The ocular lens, that's where you're looking through. That's what you're putting your eye up to. So that whole section starting sort of just below 
Uh, you can see where the green arrow goes around. That's the eyepiece. That is a removable piece, typically. You could take that out and put another piece in. As you can see, eyepiece and body are two separate pieces, often sold separately. Sometimes you can buy kits where they come together. Uh, the tripod mount foot. So in other words, we talked about earlier that Often these are the guys you're sticking on a tripod for stability because you imagine they were trying to look through a pair of binoculars at a 10 times, unless you're, you know, pretty steady, um, it can get a little shaky at times if things move. And if you go up higher than 10, it really gets tough sometimes to look at things clearly because you're just shaking too much. You're just natural body movement will cause uh, nothing but a really poor image. Um, the rotating, rotating tripod mount collar. So this is actually a piece that's often on the scopes where if for some reason you want to rotate it, say 90 degrees, you can do it. Depends on what you're looking at. It may help get a better view. And of course the objective lens, that piece at the front, that's what you're aiming at your subject. That's where all the light is going through. So this is another spotting scope and really it's, this is just a smaller version, but one big thing I wanted to sort of point out on this one, and that is that right in the middle of the top focus dials. So this has a different focusing system. So uh, scopes these days seem to come under two different concepts for focusing. One have that main focus uh, dial in the middle and basically it's all fine and course all in one versus some companies, and COA is probably the main one these days, that they stick to the fine focus and coarse focus, so dual focus dial. So that sometimes often becomes more of a, a preference, like what are you used to? I have to admit, I've used um, the scopes I've had over the years of up to now, I've all had dual focus dials, so I'm kind of used to it. So not having one is be something different for me when I switch, try one of those other scopes out. Um, the other little thing that was hard to see on some of those other slides, so I put it out separately, is what they call an aiming aid or an alignment site. So Swarovski tends to do this little add-on piece you see on the corner there on the left side of the scope. It's like a little hollow tube. And the concept is before you put your eye to the scope, you use that to find your subject, what you want to look at, and then helps you sort of orient and line up your scope to it. And Zeiss and Koa tend to put these lines or dents, if you want, sort of to follow, you use that to follow your eye to your subject. Uh, I have to admit, I don't tend to use those much myself. The alignments, the aiming aid on Swarovski is actually removable, um, but some people do find them very useful and something you, you test yourself on what works better for you. So what are the optic terms we need to know? Well, when you're new to scopes, um, and you see this 25, 60 by any 85 angled, what the heck did they just tell me? Well, so a set of numbers indicate the magnification settings from low to high, that's 25 to 60, and the size of the objective lens in millimeters, that's my 85, and the term angled represents whether that fact that my eyepiece is, comes up at basically a 45 degree angle. So that tells me now exactly everything I need to know about that scope and as far as its basic specs go. So magnification, that's an important part of the whole process. Um, it's the ratio of the apparent size of an object in comparison with what a viewer sees with the naked eye. So in other words, they do these basically uh, come up with these uh, numbers based on, they assume something is a, basically set at a thousand yards away um, and then you basically look at, say, an object in this case, you know, if you got a 60 times setting, it was going to be 60 times closer. That's pretty darn close. So example, if I got a, I'm looking at a duck 100 yards away on the lake, it actually, when I'm at 20, it actually looks like it's only about five yards away. So that's why I'm getting a nice big view of it. And yet, you know, if it's a thousand times away and I still want to see it well, I crank my scope up to 60 times and all of a sudden that thing's only about 17 yards away from me. So that's pretty darn cool that I can get so close to something without disturbing it, without bothering it. And yet I can get a pretty good view of it. So that's why scopes are pretty neat because you can really get close to things without, you know, having to be close. Um, how do you know what magnification your 
scope has, shall we say? Well, it's typically the information is printed on the actual eyepiece of the scope. And you need that because that dial is what you're moving to decide to go from say 20 to 30 to 40 to 60 and everything in between. That lets you know where you're set at the time. So that's an important piece to know. So magnification, how do I basically, it's just turn that magnification adjustment ring. So unlike a pair of binoculars where it's, hey, I've got an eight or a 10, that's, that is the magnification, nothing's gonna change. Scopes are, allow you to have very said a good wide range of magnification working all the way up, say from 20 to 60 and times and higher. Kind of give you a feel for what magnification, if you want to look at pictorially to get a better understanding of it. So think of a fellow on the, uh, on the right is looking through his scope and he's looking at this bird in the marsh and he's a thousand meters away. So that's kind of what, you know, his angle, he gets to see what it feels like is about 20 meters away. Well, if he didn't have that scope, he would have to stand where you see the gentleman on the left, the same himself. He would have to stand 20 meters away to get the same view of that bird. And depending on the species, obviously, it may not stay, you may not even get a chance to look at it because it's going to take off. So that's, again, why scopes are so great, because, yeah, you can look at something that either A, is too far for you to use a pair of binoculars, or B, you can't get close enough because it's going to flush. So objective lens size. Um, so, again, it space you'll you know, you look at a scope you can see oh it's got it's fairly large in front that objective lens or it isn't but you know what size is it well they do vary typically from 50 to 115 and they are typically somewhere it's on the scope so at least you'll know what you're dealing with um, i've noticed like in general vortex scopes seem to have a, a metal ring just behind a sunshade they've got the numbers printed there for you Swarovski and Koa tend to use it part of their product model. In other words, they don't actually print some of this information on the scope. So you're, but if you know you're using a uh, Koa 66, it's a 66 millimeter lens. If it's a Swarovski, um, you know, let's say uh, ATS 60, then it's a 60 mil uh, lens, uh, objective lens. So they build it into the names of the scopes. Um, Celestron typically uses the product model number uh, and they print it right on the side of the scope. So, you know, if you're looking at scopes and you're looking in the cabinet and you're saying, oh, wow, well, I'm not sure. Is that is that the mid size? Is that is that a full size? Generally speaking, the uh, travel size are a little simpler to see, but, uh, you know, just ask somebody, say, hey, I need to try to figure out here's what I'm looking for. Um, so objective lens diameter, and that's what we're talking about, is basically the aperture. So again, if you're into photography, you know that, you know, depending on the aperture, how much, how big that aperture is, depends how much light comes in, it is the same key in the, the performance of a spotting scope. That the bigger the objective lens, the more light that's going to come through, uh, which basically allows darker surroundings to, um, to look brighter. Uh, and games given the same magnification and quality. So the bigger the lens, again, um, I've looked through like some scopes, high-end scopes, and I'll have to say it's like things like the Swarovskis and the Koas, you look at it on a cloudy day and wow, you, you see the naked eye, it's like, wow, it looks pretty cloudy out. And you look through these scopes, you're like, wow, it actually seems brighter now. So it's kind of neat. So then that's sort of, when you're looking for uh, objective lens size, so in the middle there, you've got your uh, uh, vortex. You kind of see that metal ring there where it tells me even the magnification. Uh, in this case, they've even got that because they've included the eyepiece in the kit. Uh, Celestron, see to the right, actually tell you Ultima 65. Well, it's a 65 mil objective lens. And the Koa 502 basically tells me it's a 50 mil objective lens. So, so it comes up different ways of uh, telling you stuff. So eye relief, um, eye relief is an important item to have in your, on your scope um, because basically when optics are designed, there is an exact distance, the ocular lens, or that's the exit pupil, that's what you're looking into, should be away from your eye to obtain the full field of view. So when you look at an eye, when you see that image, it's actually focused in behind it, that lens, that outs, that last thing you're looking through, that last piece of glass if you want. And when the company has designed, the engineers have designed this, um, 
they've decided, well, to see that image the best, your eye should be X number of millimeters from that lens. So the problem is uh, you wear glasses or you don't. And typically people who wear glasses, are, are their, your eyes are physically further away from the optic eyepiece with the glasses on. Whereas if you don't have glasses, you tend to be able to uh, put your eye much closer. So eye relief, if you don't have glasses, um, and this is a term, again, if you look on the spec sheet for a, a, a spotting scope, it will tell you the eye relief. And usually these days, you typically find 17 to 18 uh, is pretty typical. So with glasses, they say you should at least 14 mils. So most good scopes today will give you that. And without glasses, you need less. So generally speaking, you know, these again, engineers know that the population there's a good, I, I don't know what the percentages are, but I know a lot of us wear glasses and a lot of us don't, but uh, we both want to use scope. So we want them to work for both of us. So focusing, so we say, well, what's focus all about? Well, it's focusing is how is how you get objects in, into clear clarity. Um, you have single focus knobs, dual focus knobs and helical focus rings. Um, so a single focus knob is something like you see on this one, where it's basically the knob in the front of the scope. You turn that and that is how you'll bring in your image from uh, blurry to clear. Dual focus knobs are designed that you basically have a coarse focus, which when you look through your scope, your starting point is with the coarse to find the, to get it, start getting that focus, find the object. And then from there, the fine focus, where you're gonna sort of just narrow it down, bring it in that little better, just to get everything perfectly perfectly focused and every detail of the feather can be seen beautifully. So that's that concept. Yet other companies, and it's more and more companies. So like uh, this focus ring is called a, a helical focus ring, and it's a combination of both uh, coarse and fine. So you're just, <clears throat> excuse me, using the one ring. And it's, I've read articles that say, well, you know, the old dual focus knobs is old style. You know, we're, we're only going to helical focus rings now. Um, I don't know. I mean, Koa to me is a, again, um, is an excellent brand and they've stuck to the dual focus. So I think they probably know it still works well. But other companies like say Vortex, on the other hand, uh, my old Vortex scope has dual focus and now they only have the single focus ring. So does seem to be the wave, but I'm not sure it's, again, it's again, personal choice. Um, so you'll hear sometimes people talk about an exit pupil. So if you look through uh, a spotting scope, and if you say point that spotting scope at a uh, direct light source, you'll see this light come through the ocular lens or this. So if you kind of look, uh, basically that is the light of beam that exit from an optic, that's the exit pupil. It's uh, described in millimeters. Um, and basically it's the size of that, it's that beam, that light, that's what's actually going into your eye. In other words, that's what you're, you're picking up as light as the object. Um, and basically you can determine an exit uh, pupil on a product on a spotting scope by basically all you do is take the magnification and um, divide the objective lens by that magnification and that tells you the exit pupil. That shows you, tells you, gives you that number, that that beam of light that's coming out of the, uh, the scope, which is not, a, is good to know, but it's not critical in sometimes in the performance. But just to give you an idea, so again, and the issue with scopes, of course, they're variable, the objective lens is staying the same, but the magnification will vary. So your exit pupil changes, uh, and that becomes important um, because as you're starting out and you're looking at your object, step one, start at 25 magnification because you're going to want to find, because now you've got the widest potential field of view, you want to find the object, you've got the most light coming in. So your eye placement isn't quite as critical. Um, you crank up the scope to 40, all of a sudden <clears throat> that, um, that beam of light coming through to your eyes getting smaller. So. If your eyes not quite centered, not quite in the right place, all of a sudden you're not getting the full image. All of a sudden you start to see cutoff. Like, oh, how come I'm, I'm only, I've got a like this dark side? Well, probably because your eye isn't lined up straight yet. I mean, it, you're now it's got smaller and you're off to the side a bit. And then, hey, I hit 60 magnification. All of a sudden, 
that little beam of light is down to 1.42 millimeters. So if my eye is not in the right spot, I'm really not going to get a good view. Um, this is also an issue, uh, part of an issue later on, we just talk a little bit about digiscoping. So it's kind of neat though, when you think about, uh, I mean, as we get older, our, uh, our pupils do tend to open less. Uh, so in bright light, so if we're out in the sun, our pupils tend to open about to about two to three millimeters. We don't need to open them wide because there's lots of light flooding into us. But as it gets darker, they will expand to four to five. And then in the dark, go to seven to eight. And you see at the bottom there where I've kind of listed out. Um, so there's those three levels. So when you get down to a 60 magnification, on an, and this is an 85 uh, objective lens, that beam of light is a lot smaller than what my minimum size, is, you know, or my eye in the dark is way bigger than that, or it's even smaller than my bright uh, eye. In other words, I, you really do have to line your eye up properly to make sure you're seeing the image when you look through a scope, because that um, set of higher magnifications, that exit pupil, that beam of light, that's your image, is actually getting quite small. So field of view uh, is another important aspect of uh, when you're looking at an object because, hey, I'm scanning somewhere. I mean, how far am I, you know, how far are you actually seeing? What can you see? Like, what is the distance across? Well, that's called field of view. And that's something that is measured, again, at 1,000 yards. Um, and you'll see it expressed on the spec sheets of scopes, and they call it linear field of view, and some will give you both, and the other is called angular field of view, which is actually in degrees. Um, generally speaking, it's easier, I think, for all of us to relate to something expressed in feet versus degrees. Um, but sometimes the um, European products uh, often don't even talk about uh, lin the, the actually the linear field of view. All they do is angular. And if they do talk about linear, often it's in meters, so it's always a little bit, and how do you compare? But angular is always the same. So you can always uh, compare any product by looking at the angular field of view. But if you're not given the information for one or the other, there's simple ways to figure it out. So to go from angular field of view to linear, it's, you just take those degrees times 52.5, and that will give you the um, a linear field of view, but if you want to go from the linear because you know that, but one of the angle is the opposite, just do a division. So if I have a field of view of 2.23 degrees, well, that's 117 feet, or it says, hey, my field of view is 68 feet, well, that's 1.3 degrees. So it's a good way to compare um, optics to see, well, once I'm looking through it, what am I getting when I start, like in that, if that's important to you, I want widest field of view as possible. Maybe you, you want to take a look at that number carefully. So basically, with a scopes, of course, uh, unlike, say, a pair of binoculars where field of view is set in standard, spotting scopes will vary based on the magnification. And like anything else, just like typically an eight times uh, binocular has a wider field of, field of view than a 10, the same with magnification on a scope. So, <clears throat> for example, if I have a 27 to 60 magnification, um, it really doesn't matter the size of my objective lens at this point. It's all about magnification now. And that typically, so at the low end, at uh, 27 magnification, uh, I've got a basically 117 to 68 at the 60, and then or 2.2 to 1.3 degrees. So you can see on that scope, the field of view drops dramatically. So if you decide like, you know, I don't like, for some reason you want something wider, you may have to look into like a wide angle uh, eyepiece. Uh, but that, as you can see below, there is a wide angle uh, eyepiece. And typically what they've done, quite honestly, they just kind of reduce the magnification. And I don't know, to me that's like, well, I can go from 126 at the low end to 81 at the high end. But meanwhile, I've lost uh, by 10 times magnification. Yeah, I don't know, it's a trade-off. Uh, personally, I prefer the higher magnification, and I will scan a bit more. So there is sort of a visual on what, you know, field of view. Um, just that little chart, there's the angle, that's where they measure it from. There's your 1,000 yards, and there's a field of view across. And there's the same when you look at it from a spotting scope concept, lower magnification, wider 
hard magnification more narrow. So close focus. Um, there are times when you still might want to uh, use your scope for something closer versus further. Uh, you know, and hey, I've got my scope out. All of a sudden, this cool bird starts bouncing around in a bush not too far from me. Hey, I'm, I may want to switch my attention from those ducks on the lake to that bird in the bush. And it varies with scopes, um, anywhere from 10 to say, let's say 26 feet. So if I think close focus is important to me, then that's something to consider. Um, but that's something you have to sort of test out. Again, they will show that in the specs. Though I have to admit in general, not a lot of people I've come across yet sort of worry too much about the close focus on a scope because it's usually not really the main concern because you often have a pair of binoculars sitting with you anyway, so uh, you can always bring the bins up to your eyes. So twilight factors. Now we're going to start talking about good ways to compare scopes and effectiveness in low light conditions and how well they perform um, as far as how good images look. So twilight factor is a number used to compare the effectiveness of spotting scopes or, bin or, or binoculars in low light conditions. Um, Magnification plays a critical role in twilight factor calculation. As the higher the power, you provide the greater, greater detail and image identification. So basically, um, you can if you can zone in on something much closer, you're typically going to see more detail and more, you know, um, all the images, everything you need to get the identification from it. Um, so twilight factor, okay, this is, this is so an equation you use is you take the objective lens, and that's the millimeters, um, by the magnification, and then you take the square root of that result. Um, and again, with scopes, because you do have various settings, it does vary based on the magnification setting. Um, and that's so, and we're, I'm gonna, you're going to see where that becomes kind of interesting and important for decision making. But always be aware when you start talking things like twilight factor, these, these are based on numbers, not based on the quality of glass or prisms or manufacturing quality. So if you're, if you're gonna, you can't really compare sometimes two scopes if one costs a hundred bucks, one costs 5,000 bucks. The twilight factor really doesn't come, like none of these numbers really mean as much. So, but if you want to figure out the numbers, twilight factor, so an example, uh, a 22 to 40 by 65 millimeter scope. So my magnification is 22 to 48, and I've got a 65 mil objective lens. So if I go from the top, the low end to the high end, uh, basically my twilight factor at the uh, low end is 37.8, and at the high end, 55.9. So what it's telling me is that with that scope, as I go higher magnification, definitely the detail on that object is going to be more apparent. And that, that kind of makes sense because I'm going in much closer. So a 30 to 70 by 99, so 30 magnification up to 70 with a 99 millimeter objective lens, you'll notice how the numbers jump. So at the low end, I'm at 54.5. So this scope uh, with only eight more magnification, but with a larger objective lens, is almost as equal to the same clarity uh, and same detail I'm going to get with that 65 mil scope at the top end. So that's that's pretty good. And that's that image is being really I can really see it well, but at a lower magnification and at higher, it's all of a sudden it's up 83.2. So if so, that tells me in that uh, low light conditions that scope is going to perform pretty good. Um, so relative brightness is the other side of the, the calculation or equation, shall we say. Uh, it's the brightness of spotting scopes of similar magnification. Um, so the larger the relative brightness number, the brighter the image. So this is this is not about the detail that I can see in the image, the you know the fine feathering. Uh, this is about the actual how bright is the image? Like is it you know can I see it well? I mean, is there lots of light coming in? So in other words, brighter tends to tell me better color um, and that's what we call get better clarity because that's the color side of things uh, <clears throat> and again with uh, with spotting scopes it does vary based on magnification setting again i will note that i put this note in for all these numbers it does not uh, take into account 
optical quality. So how do you figure out relative brightness? Well, that exit pupil we've been talking about, that small little light that comes through to your eye, it's basically you take that number and you square it um, or multiply it by itself. Um, so using the same scopes I talked about in the twilight factor. Um, so remember exit pupil is objective lens divided by magnification. So on, again, on a scope with various settings, so we have at least we can go from top to bottom and see that our brightness factor on the 65 mil scope is 8.7 <clears throat> and 1.8 at the top end. And on our 99 mil scope at 30, it's 10.9 and at 70, it's 2.0. So what we notice here is that the brightness of these two scopes are much is much closer um, because it's basically that it doesn't get, there isn't a big dramatic difference in this aspect. Uh, the bigger scope is brighter, but uh, it's not substantially uh, bigger or better than what we saw in the twilight factor. So here it is sort of just sort of sum it into this concept. So here we can see again, those two scopes side by side and the twilight factor definitely in the bigger in the bigger scope in 99 mil is much better um, at lower and higher, um, which means the nice thing about this one is that at the relative brightness um, with the twilight factor 54.5 and brightness of 10.9, um, it definitely is giving me a much better image than the smaller 65 mil scope. But again, this would be looking at products of the same optical quality. If that 99 mil scope was like very low price, you know, 500 bucks, let's say, and the 65 mil was 2000, even with those numbers as they are, chances are the 65 mil is still giving you a much brighter, much clearer scope. So optical quality. Um, so a big thing, one of the big aspects of creating optical quality is the glass that is used. Um, so standard or just regular quality glass. And we, we're talking, hey, glass you might put in your windows. Well, if you're using that for your spotting scope, you're probably gonna have a pretty low quality image. So of course, optics manufacturers realize that and say, hey, we've got to come up with better things. So they have specialty high quality glasses that tend to produce high quality image and they all tend to be pr proprietary. In other words, they've got their own names, although um, talking to a few uh, vendors it seems like there really is only two or three actual glass suppliers. And I think so extra low dispersion ED, EDG, XD, or high definition HD might basically be the same thing, but each company wants to throw their own name and own angle on it. Although ultra high definition, high definition, yeah, maybe that's a little better, who knows? But that's always when you look through the product, you'll find that out. But I think the one neat thing is, um, Again, some like in this case, it's Koa. They use actually use natural fluorite, so not actually using glass. They're actually using a crystal to make their lens. So that's kind of interesting. So this is when we kind of look through. Uh, if you're looking through, uh, you know, a pair of optics, a, a, a spotting scope that has just, you know, something you picked up somewhere for fifty bucks and it's probably got plain glass. Um, the problem is you're going to get things like that say that nice white pigeon on a bright background all has that red line in its back and that's chromatic aberration uh, because what happens is the light rays are not being held together properly they're widening out and that's what's getting to your eyes so the image looks wrong versus a much better deeper thicker glass shall we say uh, it keeps the light rays in the right uh, keeps them solid keeps them much more defined which keeps the colors proper. And that's what uh, uh, these new glasses do for us. It's also anti-reflective coatings. Um, so in other words, within, so just like, uh, so spotting scopes have prisms inside, they have coatings on the lenses. Um, and again, companies spend a lot of money, a lot of time uh, developing their own lenses to better, again, it's all about reflecting light, uh, keeping all those light rays in the right order uh, keeping them very tight versus spreading out. So Swarovski uses a thing called Swirl Bright. Vortex uses a Vortex RXR Plus. You'll see those names listed in their spec sheets often. They kind of want to tell you, hey, you got this cool coating on ours, so we think ours will be better. Um, Multi-layered coatings, what you typically want to see, because uh, 
through time. Uh, I think last time we talked about this, because this is senile, unlike for binoculars, that uh, someone asked, well, isn't the multi-layers going to sort of make things worse? And well, they don't. Actually, multi-layer coatings make it better. And that's just through, I guess, trial and error. They figure that out. But yeah, you want to see multi-layer versus single layer. You want to know that all the air to glass surfaces are coated. Uh, so generally speaking, the a lot of even I'm going to say midpoint now to high end products will all have all uh, air to glass surfaces coated. It really is the low end products that won't have that done. Um, and you know, and that's what you're you know if you're you're looking at it from the standpoint of, of what do I want to spend? Those are the things you have to accept that you're spending more money because the better quality products have done more to make them better. Um, so prisms are used within uh, spotting scopes, use refractors that have built in prisms. So it's not quite the same as a pair of binoculars. The prism actually is part of another uh, working mechanism. Um, and you still can get roof or prisms and scopes. But um, again, if it's tense, they, you can use a roof prism in a, in a scope. It does not allow for interchangeable eyepieces. So again, you don't tend to see that on the market much. So for the vast majority of all, I'd say spotting scopes, you're using, again, the poor prism when we talked way at the beginning. So way back from the 1800s, that's where the, you know, that's technology still being used today. Um, one of the differences is the, I mean, the prisms. Uh, back four typically is known as the high quality. If you see a BK7 listed as a prism type, then you can say hey, that's probably a low quality. It is a low quality product. Um, so what is image quality? Um, so you know, what is the difference? So like, well, we talk about it's, you know, it's better. Well, if you look through a scope and you see, you, know, you what you notice is the difference in the contrast, the sharpness, the resolution, lack of distortion, and bright color neutral images. In other words, you're seeing what the color of the that bird should be, not sort of slightly off to one color, you know, the, the you know, reds, bleed, you know, looking more towards an orange or something. So high contrast um, is a distinct separation of the light and dark transitions of an object. Um, when you get that good high contrast, it's almost like a 3D effect um, because if things actually seem almost like they stand out. They're almost coming out at you. It's kind of like a 4K versus a, uh, uh, you know, the old uh, high definition TVs. Um, and one of the hard parts to understand with this type of concept is if, if only ever look through a spotting scope with low contrast, you would have to look through a spotting scope with high contrast to notice the difference because that's when you're great to do side by side comparisons. Uh, and, and that's a, basically for a lot of these optical quality issues, it is kind of based on that concept. So light intensity, um, if you're getting less light through the spotting scope, you're going to end with a sort of a dark image and then more light gets clear. And again, you can see the difference there, but if I've only ever looked through a scope with dark images, do I know what the bright image looks like? So good, sometimes not a bad idea if you're looking for a scope. Sometimes it's, it's not bad to look above your budget just to get a feel for like, well, what is a better looking scope like? And you know, how far would I have to stretch? Edge sharpness, uh, you should expect to see any image you're looking at being sharp from edge to edge, not sort of like a little blurry on the sides or anything, but constant sharpness throughout. This is what we talk about the detail. So we're looking at those uh, uh, that you want to be able to see all those you know, defined parts of the feather, barbules, everything, the slight graduation in color. And that's what you want for your optics. That's what you want from a spotting scope. And basically limiting resolution is a concept that you should be able to produce the tiniest of details. In other words, you should be able to see all the small feathers, um, all the slight, you know, nuances and changes or um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's just really looking at the overall quality of the product. Um, so transmission, basically, whenever a light hits something, so i.e. if the light is hitting the objective lens, coming through that scope, hitting the refracting prisms, coming to the exit pupil, and then I get to see it. Well, if light, as it goes through that scope or it hits that objective lens, gets blocked, and light rays do get blocked, they get scattered, 
all of a sudden the light transmission starts to drop, which means my image is not going to be as sharp. It's not going to be as right as bright. <clears throat> excuse me. It's not going to be as clear. So all of a sudden, you know, with poor light transmission, I just don't have a very good looking image. And basically you'll see, um, if you can get a 90% transmission, which it means 10% of the light coming through that, uh, pro that scope was lost. That's actually pretty good. Uh, and that's at the high end for a lot of these products. Um, so it's impossible to get light through at a 100% because it's always going to be lost, but the higher that transmission number, the better your image will always be. So you can look at the optical qualities and decide, you know, what makes sense. But there's also the physical qualities. In other words, I could have this amazing scope that everything looks great, but you know, is it going to handle the use? Can I take it out uh, on a you know winter day and it's cold, and or can I take it when it might be raining outside? So what you want and your expectation is that they're all waterproof and fogproof, so the optics are sealed and purged. Um, Spotting scopes are purged with an inert gas, typically nitrogen or argon, and that pressure prevents water, internal fogging, dust, and debris from getting into that optics housing. Um, so rain should never be a concern. And spotting scopes in general, though, are not waterproof when submerged. So binoculars, on the other hand, there are definitely binoculars that you can drop in a lake, you know, let it drop 10, 15 feet, and you well, you know, get them out with a reasonable time frame, you're probably going to be good. Spotting scopes aren't quite the same. And the problem is the eyepiece and the body are separate. So if they're it's together, they're really, it's again, not always going to be a perfect seal. So although they can be, they will resist rain, they're not meant to be submerged. Um, now, an example of that, uh, the, um, I know a Swarovski body uh, and eyepiece on their own are actually rated to about 13 feet in depth of water. So if I'm up in Algonquin going, doing some backcountry camping and I'm canoeing and I'm bringing my scope, if I don't have a waterproof bag with me and there's a chance, and if there's any chance I might end up with something in the water, I may want to keep my, uh, my scope in two pieces just to keep it safe. Uh, the warranty. So manufacturers have different warranties and it's really just about, you know, checking out what does this Per, uh, what does this manufacturer offer? Um, so for some examples, Nikon is 25 years, basically manufacturing defect. Um, Zeiss is lifetime. If you have a problem with their product, they will fix it. Celestron is low as say two years. Uh, and that's again, manufacturing defect or quality versus lifetime. But there are some uh, warranties that are no fault, lifetime or specified amount. So Vortex is, I think one of their things they're really famous for is that full lifetime, no fault warranty. That includes its scopes, all its products. And I can tell you, they do stand behind it. I know a few people have had to take advantage of the, the no fault part and they, they stand behind that with no issue. Uh, Opticron offers a no fault warranty for the first five years on specific products. So basically when you're buying, uh, if that's something you, know, you should be aware of, um, I don't recommend anybody make that their uh, one and only decision. So I know I've had people tell me, well, you know, I have to buy Vortex because it's a lifetime no fault warranty. And it definitely is a real plus. But, you know, if you're spending a couple grand on a, you know, say a scope, you know, you're probably going to be pretty careful with it. I've, um, you know, I have um, currently I have a Zeiss binocular. So um, I've had them for five years. I've never had a problem with them. I've never dropped them hard enough to damage them. I'm not overly careful, but you know, I realize I don't want to damage them. So I look after them. So I think, but I do have a vortex scope, which is great. So if it ever fell over in high wind, I'm covered, but you know, I think it's just part of the picture versus something you make a final decision, the only decision on. Um, so that's a big chunk of the talk about scopes. Uh, we're going to circle back to that, but first how we're, we're going to talk about tripods because when we get back to, uh, how are we going to purchase a scope? Tripods do come into play. So let's talk about our tripods. So a tripod by definition is a portable three-legged frame or stand it uses a platform for supporting the weight and maintaining the stability of some other object. Um, 
If a tripod provides stability against downward forces and horizontal forces and movements about horizontal axis. So all it's saying basically, hey, tripods are there to hold whatever's on top steady. And that is the key. Uh, it's the same idea when you're holding your binoculars, you're using your body to, your body to hold it steady. And again, at eight and 10 times, you can typically do it. Uh, but when you start talking 20 plus, it gets really tough. So you need help. Um, so the parts of a tripod, uh, Again, I'm going to start in the, say, top left and uh, work around. And so we have a pan tilt tripod head. That is your head at the top there. In this case, that one actually has a bubble level on it. Uh, <clears throat> the handle sticking out is your tripod head panning handle. Um, on the legs, you'll see a multi-angle leg lock. So that allows you to put that tripod at different uh, legs at different angles so you can make the pod uh, sort of flatten it out, go lower. Um, you have rotating leg lock collar. In other words, right now that tripod is at its lowest point. Um, you flip those uh, lock collars up and you can make it taller. It has the center column, which once you've extended your tripod to its maximum through the legs and you still need more height, you have an option to use the center column to go higher. That has a center column lock, of course, to hold it in place. In this case, you'll notice counterweight hook. So sometimes what you want to do when you've got a tripod out and your scope's on there, you want to add extra weight for stability. They often give you a location to hang that weight from. Um, and at the top, as part of your tripod head, is your quick release plate. And at the very bottom, of course, they give us this tripod feet. Um, so the scope, the tripod, sorry, on the right side, slightly different in that it's got a ball tripod head versus a uh, pan tilt. Um, it has leg angle stop latches versus a lock, same concept. It allows me to drop that uh, um, tripod lower. Uh, it has twist leg locks versus rotating leg collars. In other words, these are just you twist and versus that you, the rotating leg collar you flip. Uh, and instead of having a hook on the side for counterweight, it actually has a hook on the actual uh, center column. So slightly different, but will does exactly the same thing. But uh, what happened here? So types of tripods. So other than the fact that uh, you know, uh, we looked at some different leg designs, but really they come in three types as far as uh, kind of like the, the spotting scope. You've got, now you have tabletop, traveler, compact, and full size. So like tripods, like uh, say spotting scopes, they do come in different sizes. Um, a travel or compact tripod, you know, basically if you're willing to travel with a tripod, it's a travel tripod. The issue is some of them are kind of big. Um, and I know um, in the past, I haven't flown anywhere in a long time, but I have taken my full-size tripod on planes with me and it's used, it is basically accepted as a carry-on. So I can travel with it, but it is big. Um, so travel comp, uh, comp or compact tripods, they do fold up smaller. Um, they can get into, you know, they come in sometimes with their own compact little package, will fit into a carry-on bag. Uh, they're also designed to be lighter, so uh, you're not carrying as much weight. Typically, they have more leg sections, so typically four leg sections. Um, and often the legs will fold up to match the size of the center post column, uh, but they also don't tend to be quite as tall as a full-size tripod. Um, full-size tripods um, basically aren't, the, when they're designing them, they're not saying, oh, we want this to make sure it's very portable. No, we want maximum stability. That's the key. Um, so based on the material you use, and of course, that's, we'll talk a bit about that, but uh, that can make, you know, them weigh not a lot more than a travel tripod. Typically only have three leg sections. Um, and not all full size tripods actually have the center post. Uh, some are designed without, uh, they tend to be taller than travel tripods and tend to have a higher load capacity. So depending on the, the size of the, uh, um, your spotting scope you're using, you may find that's something you're going to have to consider. Um, now, I'm not going to talk about tabletop tripods, really. Uh, we only have so much time. and Really, the ones you want to focus on for birding are the travel and full size. So there's kind of a little bit of a chart that does some comparisons for you. And these are just some average numbers. So as you can see, the travel tripods do just 
to tend to weigh less than the full size, although some full size come close, and that's based on material. Uh, the minimum height, um, some of the travel ones can be down really small, uh, like basically you can right down to the ground level and take, say, use them for something. Uh, um, whereas full size typically can't go as low. Uh, the maximum height, though, you can see again in travel can vary a lot from 44 to 66. So depending on uh, the, the, the design and the product, uh, it can vary a lot. Um, the folded lengths, so in other words, once you've folded it all down, and this is that travel end of things, uh, you can see how the travel tripods can go a lot smaller than the full size. Uh, but there are some that are still a little bigger. And load capacity, there is a big difference there. Um, but again, some travel tripods are pretty beefy, up to 30 pounds, but you can get some full size and go up to 55 pounds. So we're, not that you typically are ever going to use that type of weight. And in fact, as far as I know, that particular tripod is actually often used for hunters, so with heavy rifles. So I don't think as birders we have to worry about that too much. Uh, tripod materials do vary. Um, there's wood, aluminum, and carbon fiber. Um, so I've got sort of, here's a little chart, is sort of the advantages and disadvantages of each. Uh, wood is not that commonly used or sold, although I have to say uh, it's, if you want a wood tripod, Swarovski still offers one, but it's very expensive. Um, I mean, the one great thing I think about the wood tripod is that vibration absorption. So if you've ever watched the, uh, a lot of times when they're doing the surveying, they have wooden tripods and there's a reason for it because they do a great job of preventing vibration. And if in the cold weather, they, they are non-conducting, so they don't get warm and they don't get cold. But we more often are involved with aluminum and carbon fiber. So aluminum is good strength to weight ratio. In other words, they're pretty strong and can hold a fair amount of weight. They're durable, they're pretty tough. They typically less expensive than carbon fiber. Um, and they're steady because they're a little heavier, so they tend to be a little steadier than sometimes in carbon. Um, but they are, they do absorb temperature. So if you're on a really cold day and you've got to pick up your uh, aluminum tripod and you don't have gloves on, it can be really cold. Or if you're in hot environments, they will warm up. And that's why some of them have like that rubber, uh, you find parts of the section actually have like a rubberized coating on them, like a foam. Uh, so it's nice in the cold weather, you don't have to grab the metal. Uh, they can corrode, um, alum it's uh, aluminum oxide. In other words, over time, it can happen if they're not looked after properly. Um, and interestingly, I mean, they can handle, uh, you know, getting whacked pretty good. In other words, they tend to bend versus a uh, sharp blow to a leg will bend it versus shatter it versus say so carbon fiber, uh, again, pretty good vibration dampening, more similar to wood. In other words, if I'm using my scope and I'm at 60 meg, I don't want something else moving my scope. I want it to be steady and as rock solid as possible. So vibration dampening is a good thing. Carbon fire is very strong, so get good strength to weight ratio. Doesn't tend to absorb the temperature. They don't corrode. Uh, and it's 40% lighter and 10 times more durable than aluminum. So that's why they also tend to be a lot more expensive uh, because they are, you know, they, they are lighter and durable and the material is, is more expensive. So they take advantage of charging you for it. Uh, but they aren't quite as steady as aluminum. So often you want that counterweight hook with them. Um, and the only, probably the next downside, you got a big heavy spotting scope because the bottom end is so light, they can be a little bit top heavy. So you want to be, definitely want that uh, counterweight. Um, types of tripod heads. Um, generally speaking for spotting scopes, you use a pan head. It's a fluid two way, or they call them, or there's just two ways, ball heads and gimbal heads. There are tons of other tripod heads out there. Uh, if you look online, you'll see lots, but really most heads are designed more for photography. These are the three that you typically use for spotting scopes. And there's an image of the, the fluid two-way, the ball head and the gimbal. Uh, a two-way pan head looks very, very similar. But I'm really just going to deal more with the fluid two-way uh, pan head. Um, now, the one thing you want to find on all your, uh, your head of your, your tripod is a quick release plate. Uh, basically, if you're looking at a tripod head that does not have a quick release plate, don't bother. Um, you will 
you'll decide you'll rule the day when you decided to buy that because it'll be a pain in the butt using it uh, down the road when you want to take your scope off you want to pack it away you want to put it back on maybe you want to put something else on that same tripod the quick release concept allows you to do it in other words you've got the quick release plate which could be placed on any item uh, tripod uh, or a, a spotting scope uh, camera and now you can use it interchangeably so definitely you want a quick release plate um, so the ball head, uh, ball heads are typically more used for photography, uh, but they can be used for spotting scopes. Uh, the problem with a ball head is when you're painting in the observing bird, you want a nice, smooth, precise movement, whereas ball heads, you have to control them a lot because they can move in all directions. And so, in other words, often not nearly as smooth as a pan head. Um, but the problem is sometimes, hey, you're traveling, you've got your camera with a large telephoto lens, in a spotting scope, but you only want to bring one tripod. So sometimes the uh, ball head can make sense because you can use it for multiple items on a trip. Um, and they range for anything from 100 to 500 plus. The gimbal head is, well, if you're using a very large spotting scope or again, somebody with a very big telephoto lens, uh, these things are designed to handle very heavy weights. Um, so they make sure that the item, the scope or the lens is balanced perfectly on the center of gravity. Very simple, effortless to move, but also typically one of the most, pretty much the most expensive of the three styles and good quality range from three to a thousand. And I'm gonna say, I found the $300 ones I think on Amazon and I know the better ones are getting closer to a thousand in general. So that's an, they're expensive, but they're very good. But most typically we use the fluid two-way pan head, I think, for, uh, for most spotting scopes. Uh, it basically allows you to pan and scan horizontally and tilt up and down. Um, the fluid head incorporates, it's got a uh, fluid chamber that basically the hydraulic is like a damping system. So in other words, it reduces movements and vibrations, kind of gives a bit of a drag. So when you're panning or tilting, this thing actually makes it very smooth uh, and so very not jittery. Um, so if you've got a basic two-way pan head, not fluid, with no fluid chamber, it tends, there's no really resistance, no drag. It tends to be a little more jerky. Um, you don't actually see non-fluid two-way pan heads much anymore. Where I usually have seen them is on, basically it's a tripod on a headset that's very cheap. Uh, but, but, you know, the good thing is a good quality uh, fluid uh, pan head is only one to 200 bucks. So they're not super expensive and uh, said they do work really well. Um, so you've got, you know, you've kind of, if you've got your scope, you've got your tripod, you've got your head. One thing you want to do is how do I set up my scope? How do I put this all together now? Uh, so first step, um, is attaching the quick release plate to the spotting scope. So there's what we're kind of showing you here. So there's your quick release plate, plate and there's a screw mount on the bottom of, on, under, beneath that scope, uh, the tripod mount, there's a location where you screw that into. And usually on the back of a quick release plate, there's like a D-ring you can use to tighten it in, or sometimes you have to use like a coin, like a little screwdriver, but most of them have the D-rings now, so to make it simple. Um, Attach the scope to the tripod head, so place it on top. Um, so adjust the height of the tripod for comfortable viewing, and you'll see here sort of the, an idea of what it, what's comfortable viewing. Well, the gentleman on the, the left is using an angled scope. He's got to bend over a bit. The gentleman in the middle has got a straight scope, so he kind of looks just straight ahead. And then you can kind of see again the, the two people on the right. Uh, one's using an angled, one's using a, a, a straight scope. So see a slightly different posture required. You want to adjust the eye relief. Again, we talked about glasses or no glasses. <clears throat> if it's correct, you have image that is uh, clear from edge to edge. If your eye relief is too short, you'll have shadowing in the lower part of your field of view. And if your kind of is too long, you call it vignetting or shadowing all around the field of view. So kind of gives you clues as to do I have my eye relief set in the right place and then you want to test it um, so basically you want to set the magnification to the lowest power to start use a focus knob or dial and focus on an object 
and then available focus on an actual optics chest chart. So we always do when you start with a spotting scope, I always find even when I'm out in the field, typically if I'm looking out at the lake or the marsh or in the gorge, I'm going to use at the higher range, the lower range, I should say first, just to see where everything is and then narrow in on the subject I want to look at. So that's kind of the same way when you want to test it. Um, then you want to increase magnification to your midpoint, you know, just the focusing, uh, and then basically uh, you're going to repeat the process at the highest magnification because you want to confirm that at all levels of magnification that that spotting scope gives you a clear, concise image. These charts are designed to, so you know, is there line separation? Uh, you know, what numbers can I see? Are things running together? Um, so definitely work well to make sure that definition clarity and again at all levels is working properly. Uh, the one thing we do have in our store in this case, we actually have a, uh, uh, so it's always nice if you can then once you've done your initial test, get it all set up, look at an actual object. Hey, look at a real bird. Uh, we have bird feeders outside our store. People can sometimes set up a scope and look that way, but we also have uh, uh, stuffed um, uh, mounted uh, red-tailed hawk in the store that we often use and people can see that feather definition on it by you know playing with the scope and seeing it from different levels and say how well does that pick up the coloring and uh, say those fine details you expect so uh, definitely you want to test a scope out a lot before buying uh, what are you looking for say again a chromatic aberration or color fringing um, so basically um, if the lens fails to focus the various wavelengths of light colors onto the same convergence point. That's what showed that other image where, you know, the light waves are getting big instead of being nice and defined and narrow. Um, and the color distortion often creates an outline of an unwanted color on the edge of an object. And the best way to test this is often look, if you can, if it's possible, look at a, on a sunny day, look at an object with the sun behind it. And that's, if you get that color fringing, then you've got chromatic aberration and it becomes very obvious. And that's not a good thing. Astigmatism, um, in other words, the, the scope in this case can focus in the center, but not at the edges or vice versa. In other words, you've got focusing is not across. It's not that clear image, edge to edge sharpness we talked about earlier. That means a scope has some form of astigmatism, which is again, sign of not great setup on the uh, the lenses and the prisms are not working as well as they should. Uh, edge distortion, basically you got barrel or pin cushion distortion where it almost looks like the object is uh, either bowing out or sort of bulging inward. So again, if you see those type of things and you're looking like, you know, somebody you're looking at it and think, I can't, what's wrong with this image? Something's funny. Um, you know, think about this because that might be what you're seeing and again that just means you've got edge distortion and not again a good product um, other things to check is how well can you focus um, what is a focus ratio like close to far far to close and again that's that issue of the uh, two knobs the, the coarse and the fine focus versus say that helical ring do you find you prefer one over the other if you've never used a scope then it might be worth trying one of each type just decide what makes more sense to you um, magnification changes. Um, does it move easily? Do you find you, you spot it? It's quick and smooth when you change magnification. Everything, you know, it's not like this sort of this lag. You're thinking, like, hold it, what's going on? And generally speaking, good quality scopes, eyepieces are not going to give you that problem. So, kind of talk. So, we've talked about that whole, uh, you know, what, are, what is a scope? What do the numbers mean? Tripod, the head. So, now it's coming down to like, I got info. So what, are, what should I do about purchasing? What, what's my plan? So here's, here's what you want to think about before purchasing a scope. Uh, well, how do you want to use a spotting scope? Is it basically local use? So I'm going to go to my local park. I'm going down to Sam Smith. I'm going to travel, say to, 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 to Point Keeley, uh, or, you know, I'm just going to use it around the house, do my, you know, 5k birding and just using the local parks because I got a nice pond or marsh there. Uh, am I going to, you know, do a lot of travel? I'm going to be on the airplane a lot because I want to go to, uh, uh, you know, South Africa to go birding. I want to go to Costa Rica. Then, you know, that can change my, what, what do I really want to do? Or I may, of course, want to do all of the above, of course, and then I got to take that into account. And then one important thing uh, with spotting scopes is will you be sharing it with a birding partner? Because this will come up shortly. But is this a scope for you or for you and someone else or multiple people? 
Um, and hey, am I a, am I an all day am I a birder who likes to get up bright and early and hit the lake and see all the cool ducks and any water you know shorebirds that are hanging around? Or do I like to go later in the day? Or am I really a daytime guy? I, I want to get my sleep, go during the nice bright sunny days, not worry about the clouds. Or is it all three? So you want to be taking all in like, you know, what is your, you know, how are you going to do things? So when you buy a spotting scope, one of the first things to think about is do you want angled versus straight eyepiece? Um, so most spotting scopes, uh, most companies offer a product. Uh, in this case, let's say Vortex has a razor, 2760 by 85, identical scope, but in an angled versus straight. So all those twilight factors, the clarity, the brightness, it's all the same. It's just, it's a different shape now. So why would I want one versus the other? So angled, um, so it's easier to share the scope with other people. So if you are birding with a significant other partner or tend to go with a group of people and you're the only one with the scope and you wanna share, then it makes sense typically to have an angled design because basically what you're gonna do, is set the height of the tripod to the shortest person so they can view things comfortably, whereas the taller person will have to bend over a bit and look. Um, they tend to be a little easier to look up at birds. So, you know, if I'm looking up at, say, a heron rookery and I'm kind of in the, I got to crane my head up, then, you know, actually uh, the angled ones are a little simpler because you don't have to crane your head as much. Uh, uh, this was something someone mentioned to me once. I, I'm, I'm not a, I don't do a lot of sketching. So it, uh, Surprise! I thought, oh, that's interesting. That makes sense. So, if you're into sketching and you're in the field and you want to do sketching, they said, you know what? When I look at my through my angle, my sketchbook is right there. I just I go. I don't even have to change my head location. I just start sketching. I thought, oh, good point. So, if you're into sketching, the angle would make sense. Um, typically, then with an angled scope, you don't need as tall a tripod because um, you're again you're tending to keep it shorter, and you often don't need to extend the center column. I personally don't like extending the center column as much as, I like to leave it down as much as can. I can because the all point behind a tripod is to work off three points of contact versus if I use that center column too high, really all I've, I've created my uh, tripod is turned into a monopod. Uh, now, of course, the downsides, if you're sharing your scope, uh, you do have to be concerned. Maybe I really maybe have to adjust it as people change. And of course, there's our gentleman on the right who's showing you kind of the typical angled viewing posture. Um, if you're with straight scope, um, if you're the only one using the scope pretty much 90% of the time or more or 100%, then it can make a lot of sense. Uh, you find it uncomfortable to have that slight bend over to look because, hey, you're kind of be out, say, scanning, you know, over at Hillman Marsh for long periods of time, maybe being slightly bent over is not comfortable. Uh, you will typically need a trawler tripod, or you might have to extend the center column. Um, I find that one thing, definitely the straight uh, eyepiece is if you're scanning, using your binoculars to scan, say, the horizon, looking for things, it's a very easy transition from your binoculars to a straight eyepiece um, versus having to duck your head down. I find that better. Um, and of course, if it's just you for you, the eye relief is always in the right place. Um, if I bought angled or straight, as I said, most pretty much every company makes that uh, in, you know, they are available in all, typically every model they sell has one, has both, which means they do come in full mid or compacts. Um, so if you're looking at the size of the scope, you gotta decide, well, what's the weight of the spotting scope and the tripod? Like how much weight do I want to deal with? How is a portability a big thing? I mean, I really wanna be able to pack it up and carry it around with me very quickly and easily. Um, or is that twilight factor relative brightness really the big thing? Like I'd rather have a big giant scope and have great images at all times. Um, so what, so when you consider the weight and the length, so compact scope tends to be anywhere from 16 to 42 ounces and they tend to be about nine to 10 inches in length. The mid size scopes tend to be about 37 to 56 ounces and 11 to 14 in, in length. And a full size, often 64 to 80 ounces. So these get into the heavy guys, and, but they're not a lot bigger but, uh, than the midsize, but 15 to 16. Um, so again, you have to think, is it too heavy to carry? Is it too bulky to travel with? And of course, that's just the, we're just talking scope size and weight there. Um, 
And just sort of as a reminder, don't forget, you're also carrying a tripod with you and that adds a bit of weight to it as well. So that weight is going up by, uh, you know, depending on which full size or travel uh, tripod you're using. So when you look at it, so if that whole concept of, you know what, I just want the best image possible. It's not about portability. It's about, hey, I, you know, I really want a really great image. Um, here's a little chart you can sort of get a feel then. Um, so if detailed images, detailed brighter images is your main criteria, you want a full size scope. Uh, if digiscoping is important and you want the best possible images, you, again, you're purchasing a full size scope. <coughs> full, sorry. Uh, if portability is the most important part of the purchase, look at, you know, travel or midsize. And if you look at that twilight factor and relative brightness, uh, what you will notice um, as those lenses get bigger, those numbers get better. And that's why there is an ongoing push, uh, it seems, with the vendors, manufacturers, they used to create bigger, bigger objective lenses. Uh, says on Swarovski's come out with a 115 millimeter lens now. So again, the push to be, and I think because the market demands it, people want the best quality image they can get. So that's why you start looking at these full size scopes. Um, so how do you get, you know, if you're good, if you're, uh, I've got the info I want. I've kind of got a feel. I understand more about scopes. What's my steps now to buy one? Well, think about this. Set a budget. Put the budget in place. For, buy the best you can afford. Um, scopes have a, there's a big range in price. Um, and believe me, you pay for what you get. Uh, you notice a little side there. I've got from 200 up to $7,000. And I can tell you there is a huge difference between those, in this case, those two scopes. Um, but what fits your budget? Um, so, but definitely be prepared to say, you know, I'm going to, you know, if I want the best, you know, put them out the best you can get and then think about it. If it's just, a, if it's a starter scope, uh, hey, I may not even use it much. Hey, 200 bucks is probably fine. You know what? It's going to get you started. You'll get a feel. Uh, maybe it's a holdover to you got a few extra bucks to buy, you know, one down the road. You want an existing scope, you want a better one, then probably be prepared to spend a few more bucks, but always bring in, if you're gonna do, um, best thing is always side by side comparison. So if you have something old you wanna replace with new, bring the old with you so you can do side by side testing. Um, if you want a scope that's gonna good, be good for the next 10, 20 years, and again, consider that, again, your budget's gotta be higher. Uh, do your research, um, do some research ahead of time, go online and check some review websites. Um, there's a couple I've noticed in the past. Best Buy is good for 2022. The Optics Den, 10 bus spotting scopes of 2022. Best review guide. Online, <clears throat> online chat groups and servers. Uh, Discourse these days has a optics and burning equipment uh, uh, server, so you can talk with other folks and get other people's opinions. Uh, online customer reviews. I mean, Amazon sells a lot of this stuff, and people... We you know, expect some of those are real reviews so that uh, you might get a feel for a product. Um, but always remember that all online reviews, all online, whether it be, uh, said, Amazon or these websites, these are based on, you know, people's opinions. I've tried them and I like this better, I like that better. So always the best thing to do is try it yourself. But you can use that as a starting point, all those reviews. Um, and, you know, if you decide on the type and size, so just again, do you want full size, mid size, compact? So based on the question you answered earlier, what do you want to do with this scope? And you can start to narrow down and then you can set your budget because generally speaking, compact, you know, it, not necessarily always cheaper, but, uh, you know, they can be less expensive than in mid size versus full size and it depends on the brand. Um, and kind of one thing I was going to throw in here just as a, kind of throws a bit of a monkey wrench for some folks. It's an interesting option, but you do have to have the money. So um, if, we, if you decided, well, I'd really love a portable scope. I'd really like a travel version because I do a lot of traveling, but hey, when I'm at home, I really want that big giant honking objective lens for the best image possible. Well, Swarovski decided they've got their product and it's called the modular spotting scope. And basically it is a set of eyepieces and uh, objective bodies that you can mix and match. So you could essentially have, you know, in a straight eyepiece, an angled eyepiece, 
and one, you know, for this trip, I'm taking the smallest ocular lens or objective lens because I want to go traveling, but hey, I'm going out to do some digiscoping, so I'm going to take the big giant 115 with me. So they've kind of left that option where people can sort of mix and match uh, without having to buy multiple scopes. They've also got this cool thing called a BTX. It's basically well, it's using like a binocular stereo vision. So, and they've done their studies and said, you know, people perceive things way much better through two eyes than one. So, you know, okay, but this is a very expensive system. So if it's something you think might be of value to you, you'd better, you need to really have that high budget. Uh, of course, always test the spotting scope. The very last thing, always, uh, always test it. Go to some place, borrow someone, uh, borrow a pair, borrow the scope, uh, but always test before you buy. Um, so spotting scopes typically come with something more than just a spotting scope in the box. They used to pretty much all come with extra stuff. Now it's most, they all come with rain guards, cover the ocular lens, objective lens cover, project, protect the objective lens. Uh, Vortex still does include uh, cases, uh, fitted cases for this for most of their products. A lot, the other companies who used to tend not to anymore. Um, so these days you have to consider some of the accessories. So if you want something to protect your scope, uh, whether it be, as you can see, that fitted neoprene stay on case, which is kind of nice, nice solid, uh, keeps everything in place for you versus a fitted case. So basically like a carrying strap, but fits your scope. And again, typically these are designed specifically for the scope versus just a carrying case, which is more of a loose baggy thing. And then of course, in the fitted carrying case and the carrying case, uh, they do open up. You can see the zippers. You can see at the front end of, for both the objective lens, you just unzipper, it drops down. Um, you unzip the big zippers, you can get to your focusing. Uh, there's a zipper or a strap on the bottom to put it onto a tripod. So, but you know, sometimes it's worth looking at because say when it's inclement weather and you want to protect it or you're walking through the woods, uh, to get to that local marsh, you know, this will help stop the scrapes and bumps. Uh, cleaning kit, always good to have. Lenses get dirty, whether it be the objective lens or the ocular lens. Uh, always nice to be able to clean them off when things are getting a little messy. Tripod bag, that's kind of a new, yeah, I don't know if it's new or not. I only became aware of it about a year ago. Uh, but they're kind of cool because now all of a sudden, uh, it's basically a backpack that's designed to fit on your tripod. Uh, with your scope on there. So in other words, you can actually put, as you can see the gentleman in the middle, he's actually got his scope is on the tripod. His uh, tripod is fully open, ready to use, but he's carrying it around on his back. So, hey, I'm walking along that shoreline, you know, I've been placed tons on Lake Superior. We would love to have had this set up because otherwise, it, you know, you're, oh, it's unfolded. I got to re, you know, it, your scope is folded because you're carrying it on your shoulder. Now you got to reopen it. This thing, hey, just drop in and start looking. So kind of neat. Lots of great storage. I've tried this one myself. There are others, but I know this one works really well and does actually help a lot of, because you've got carrying your gear, let's say, some of the extra stuff you might have with you um, in the bag gives that extra weight to the tripod. Um, and of course, one of the big spotting scope accessories these days is used for digiscoping. Uh, so a lot of people, so, um, that whole idea of, hey, I want really great picks, uh, but even with my, you know, one, you know, 500 zoom lens, I still can't get as close as I can with a spotting scope. So digiscoping, so digital camera, basically it's a union of two words, digi digital camera and spotting scope. Uh, it's basically digital photography, typically using a smartphone DSLR or compact camera. Uh, you can take pictures through the scope and you can get excellent photographs. Um, you need an adapter that fits the equipment you're using for the photos. So whether it's your phone or DSLR, but also need then a piece that fits on your, on the eyepiece of your spotting scope. Uh, many companies make their own digiscoping products. In other words, they've decided they're going to get things that fit perfectly to their scope in a specific phone or camera. So it's very one set. In other words, uh, you ought to decide, well, what am I going to use a phone or the camera? Or am I going to buy two? Uh, but there's a lot of aftermarket companies that are making adapters that handle uh, specific equipment configuration. In other words, they'll handle uh, all you know all smartphones. They'll handle various uh, DSLRs or compact cameras, and the and the adapters to fit the spotting scope eyepieces are again 
um, variable. In other words, they fit a lot of different spotting scope eyepieces. And one of those companies is PhoneScope. Uh, they have a universal smartphone case. So I'm just really looking at it from smartphones. Uh, I don't want, like, there are, again, lots of different options, but I <clears throat> find most people are doing it with the smartphones these days. I guess just convenience. Hey, we all have one with us, and they do have pretty darn good cameras in them. So the universal smartphone case uh, will hold various size smartphones. From there, you need that next piece, the universal eyepiece adapter, and that comes in a couple different sizes based on the size of your scope. And then you can see on the right, kind of put it all together. Um, and a nice, uh, yes, what, rusty egret being taken a picture of, um, or reddish egret, sorry. Um, but uh, that works pretty good. I've tried the phones. I have a phone scope. I like it. It, it works pretty good. Uh, it is plastic, so sometimes I find it can be the, the, the adapter is a little finicky. Uh, but I, the biggest problem I have with it at times, and they may have fixed it by now, is I wasn't big enough to hold my phone uh, with a um, with a with a protective case on it. So I found that a little bit disappointing. So I did <clears throat> found another product called by Novagrade. Uh, they have the same idea: universal smartphone case. Uh, they have a set of compression rings that comes with the kit, so again to fit various uh, different size eyepieces. I do like there is only in fact it is made from metal, very solid, and it does open wide enough. To, in fact, they can go wide enough to fit many tablets. So I had no issue fitting my phone into this one, but they are somewhat more expensive than the phone scope. So, and phone scope does make specific um, units for specific phones. So again, you can buy one that will fit your phone exact. Just make sure it will fit with the, uh, if you use a protective case, um, to make sure it will fit as well. Uh, and can you get good picks? You you can for sure. Um, some of these are, you know, here's some picks. <laughs> Purple Sandpiper, Green Heron, some Harlequin Ducks. I know there's been some sighted around and a Snowy Owl. So, you know, depending on uh, the scope you use, depending on the lighting conditions, uh, you can get better, you know, better or worse picks, shall we say, with digiscoping. If digiscoping again is back to like that is a big thing for me, you're definitely looking at full size scopes for that big objective lens, lots of light, you're gonna get great images. And thank you for uh, listening to me talk about spiny scopes and tripods. Uh, that is our show. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, we've had a couple questions pop up in the chat. One you already answered. So it's like they asked the question and then it was like almost the next slide you answered it. So that was great. Um, somebody does want just to reiterate, do the angled and straight versions usually cost the same? Yes. Yes, they do. Um, the one thing that I discovered having, I have an angled scope now, is it's not good for window mount scoping in a car. Ah, that, that was that was a horrible lesson I learned one winter. <laughs> Oh, good point. Good point. You're right. Because I grew up, well, you know, I've been, well, you know, I've been birding a long time and um, the, we had like a Bushnell uh, Space Master, which was just a big single long tube is what it mm -hmm. looked like. So that's what I grew up looking through in a car window um, on a window mount scope. And so it was a very different experience with an angled scope. So I had to <laughs> modify my my uh way so that Swarovski one you know if it wasn't a million dollars would be a great <laughs> option <laughs> so I'm going to put yeah. it out there to people if you have any more questions um just pop them into the chat and I'll make sure that they get answered for you um we'll give people a couple minutes to uh just get some questions in there if they have any more um like I said, this uh, presentation is being recorded, so you'll be able to come back here on Facebook and watch it again if you want to. Um, if you want to take a closer look at all of those great charts that you had. Um, uh, Brian says, thank you so much to think about. He's now has some research to do, but he said, thank you for this. Um, everyone's happy with it. Um, so we'll just see if there's any more questions that come up. Um, and like I said, we'll be uh, putting this up on YouTube as well. So there'll be a couple different spots where you can find the presentation again if you want to watch through parts of it again. All right. Uh, another thank you from Cindy. Violet says thank you. Um, yes, 
it was great. Lots of great information in this presentation. So, um, all right, I'm just gonna wait and see if there's anything else. All right, well, it looks like we don't have any additional questions. So you, you just covered everything tonight, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or people are in information overload and they may have questions yes, I'm going to, like, at, at a later date. So yeah. um, uh, that's the, oh, somebody says they've been birding for years, but have never owned a scope. Any suggestions of brands to start with? Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, between, uh, so if, again, if you look from a standpoint of price points, uh, if you're looking for a lower price, you could definitely start with Celestron. If you're looking more for mid price ranges, look at the Coas and Vortex. If you're uh, looking for high end, uh, again, go back to uh, uh, Swarovski and Coa in general. That's probably the good way to start. Uh, you know, decide like, you know, uh, where do you want to spend the money? Like if, it, if you've got, always again, take into account when you do that budgeting of uh, what you're going to spend, realize you do need that tripod and tripod head. Yeah. Um, so take that into account, but, uh, definitely those are three brands that, uh, you know, do really well or four, I mean, cause it just depends on your price point, but said so starting at the low, you know, low end is still so Celestron makes a lot of, you know, good, but cheaper product. Um, you know, Vortex makes and Coa both make some mid price, very good products, but midpoint prices. And I'm talking like, you know, 500, 600 bucks. Uh, but, and they also make some stuff into the thousands and Cole and Swarovski, of course, could have been your three and four thousands. So, yeah. Okay. So yeah. Brian, I just want to, Brian just asked what a mid range budget was. So that's kind of in that, you know, five to six, well, probably like that 500 to a thousand dollar range would be about the mid range pricing. Yeah. 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 yeah that, in that, and that's, you know, a good product from a good company. Yeah. Uh, that you would be happy with for a number of years. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we have a question from Cindy, and she asks, what kind of selection do you have in your store? Uh, we basically carry pretty much what uh, we do. Have, we have the Celestron. We've got the uh, Vortex. We've got the Koa. We've got the Swarovski. Uh, that's our, in scopes, that's our big four right now. Right. Okay, that's great. Um, I'm just going to wait and see. So, somebody says they're upgrading from a Koa to a Swarovski. Okay. It, that's interesting because depending... You know, um, I mean, I, it's curious, and they like. I'd love to talk to that person in the store because um, Swarovski is great. There's no doubt. But when you start talking, in my mind, you start talking those high end ones. It, Koa makes a really nice scope. <laughs> yeah, um, and I think it really does come down to that sort of personal. You know, what do you think looks better? But uh, yeah, it'd be interesting because I mean, yeah, if you're going from say a, a mid price Koa like a five fifty six sixty up to a, an ATS or an STS, then yeah, that, uh, I mean, yeah. those are, yeah. But if you're looking at the COA 880s and 990s, then they're pretty, pretty darn close. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of it just comes down to that personal preference again, yeah. Yeah. Um, when you get into that, because, well, you yeah. know, you're gonna, if you get either one of them, you're gonna have a good scope, so. You betcha, you betcha, yeah. yeah. And I and I will uh, attest to the Vortex, uh, um, warranty i remember uh somebody dropped their scope off the hawk tower oh. at holiday beach and uh, vortex know. replaced their scope for them so yeah. yes um so it is a good warranty <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah no that's that so. is definitely uh we sell a lot of uh the vortex products to a lot of uh, uh wildlife biologists field workers yeah um, the yeah, I, 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 you know, I, coming at it from a, like the park perspective, it's definitely kind of, that's a very attractive uh, type of optics to buy if you're going to be using it with the public. Yeah. Because, you know, having that kind of a warranty helps protect your investments. So um, I did have a really quick question for you, and it's, it's in the time of COVID, and mm. um the idea of sharing optics. Do you have any recommendations? Like, um, if you've got a good cleaning kit, is that sufficient for that kind of cleaning, or is there, a, or are there products we should be avoiding using on our optics? You know, because um, I know a lot of people. You know, if you're out and you're sharing optics, you might want to clean 
uh, the optics in between you. Yeah. So if, I wondered if you had any recommendations on that front. Yeah, from the standpoint of COVID and we're looking at how do we control you know, a virus, uh, definitely the cleaning kits provided, that's just about dust and dirt and maybe grease. But uh, so that's one thing we ran into at the store uh, way back. So back in 2020, shall we say, uh, we sell to people who want to try out optics, but yet we recognize that, okay, how do we, you know, how do we keep everything properly cleaned uh, after usage? So we, we have been, we, and I, I can't honestly say I know the name of the product, but it is a, a, a white that is antibac it is an, it is used to kill viruses. It's actually a product my wife came across or knew about because she worked in the dental field and it's what they use to kill all the germs in their in their operatories. So we approached all the various vort, uh, uh, optics makers and said, hey, look, we need to wipe the, everything down now to uh, you know try to reduce the spread of uh, COVID and. It was funny because it was they all re the response from every one of them, all of them was the same. We've never run into this before. So I our question was, well, how will the bodies react to this type of thing? And we did it for well, we still do it, and quite honestly, it, it works. I mean, it doesn't hurt them. Um, I mean, we don't wipe the actual glass lenses with this product, but because your eyes, you're not really touching the glass; it's the rubber coatings around it. Uh, the bodies. So if you go on any of these sites, I, you know, I get emails all the time about buy your COVID, uh, you know, wipes, you know, the antiviral wipes and that. That's what I would suggest. Just bring a pack of those with you and wipe your uh, scope or your binoculars down with that. And so far I haven't, uh, we haven't had a problem. It's worked well, but definitely the cleaning kits aren't going to do anything for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because they're designed to clean the glass for a different yeah. in a different way, and yeah, I get that. Exactly. So, I just thought I'd ask the question because yeah. I, I, I know say, it's, uh, it's something that's come up a few times just in in discussions yeah. that I've had with people about optics. So, I will uh, I will find that name and I'll, I can email it to you. That'd be great, and I'll I'll be yeah. sure to get it posted in the comments. So, if anyone else yeah. is interested as well, yeah. well, thank you. <laughs> that answered well, my question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think we're, we haven't had any other um, uh, uh, comments come up in uh, the chat, so I think we've answered everyone's questions. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, uh, this was another great presentation. Um, just so everyone knows, we're in the process of working through a schedule for uh, lots of uh, new presentations coming uh, in the next few months so keep tuned we'll post them on um, our Facebook page and we'll also be putting out call notes to uh, let everybody know uh, exactly what's coming up and when so uh, I hope everybody's staying safe and healthy and getting out and enjoying some birds at the same time so uh, happy new year 